You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today went from $50,000 in debt to financially free in just two years through Airbnb. And today she's doing something she likes even better. I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Well Show. Ziana McIntyre has been an Airbnb host since 2012. After 2020, she pivoted to medium-term rentals and is now releasing her book on the topic, 30 Day Stay, an investor's guide to mastering the medium-term rental, co-authored with Sarah Weaver. Ziana has been to 47 countries and spends half her time in Boulder, Colorado. And she's here with us today on The Real Well Show to tell us how she's able to fund all of these travels. Welcome, Ziana. Thank you so much for having me, Kathy. This is a little bit of a dream. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I've uh, listened to a bunch of episodes, I think probably 50 or so. So I'm just like, oh, this is this is one podcast I'm really excited to be on. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, I think you have some really exciting information to share about how people can uh, have multiple uses for their properties and and, um, different ideas that people know about short-term rentals. They know about, of course, long-term flipping, but MTRs. I didn't even know what that was until you guys reached out. So let's talk about that. What's an MTR? It is a medium term rental. So we've got short term rentals that are under 30 days, long term rentals that are usually a year. And now there's this medium term rental space, which is a furnished rental that's a month to month rental. And very often the average day is about three to six months. So the average tenant is a traveling nurse and they get three month contracts. And would that apply just about anywhere or are there certain markets where it's more prevalent? So one thing I love about it is a lot of the markets that you guys are already working with turnkey providers in work really well for this model. And if people are having a hard time getting cash flow now, then that could be an added benefit of going, you can still buy with the turnkey provider, but then you do your own rental strategy right on top of it. Um, And so a lot of the markets you guys are already in, like Cleveland has a huge hospital complex. um, And so that's really popular. And then it's just these bigger metros anyway, or how having a lot of people move into them. So Atlanta would probably be a really good place for that and Charlotte. Um, But in general, we like to look towards the places that have big hospital complexes. So why would a traveling nurse not just take an Airbnb? Is Is the medium term rental a better deal, better price for them? Well, so you can advertise on Airbnb, but yeah, generally the medium term rentals are found through Furnish Finder and they end up being a little bit cheaper. And so they kind of go that route. And so on that Furnish Finder website, it's a little bit mom and pop still. And so Mm -hmm. people are just not as professional in the Airbnb space. You've got a lot of boutique hotels and interior designers. And so it's a little bit harder to compete. And so it's nice that this kind of like average Joe can do really well there. So what does it cost to get, uh, let's just say, a, I don't know, a three, well, I was going to say a three bedroom home, but you probably don't need that for a traveling nurse. I, I would guess that maybe it's a different kind of product. Yeah. So what, so I've bought a few products for you guys. I got lucky enough to get into it in 2019, right before just the big boom. And so I bought a few places in Ocala. Um, Ah. and one of them was the quads that they were selling that were all two bedrooms. And so I haven't turned that into a medium term rental yet, but I suspect it would do really, really well. And so I like to do one and two bedroom units because generally a nurse is either traveling alone with another nurse or like their child or their partner. So they don't normally need a much bigger space than two bedrooms. And that's kind of an awkward size. So you might even get a good deal on a, on a property that's a one or two bedroom or a fourplex. Yeah. Like you said, that's one or two bedrooms each. Yeah. I love it because one bedrooms usually sit around. Like people are just not, you know, they're like, well, if I'm finally going to buy one, at least two bedrooms, what am I going to do with a one bedroom? And so those places you can often get a deal or, um, something like that. So I, I get excited about knowing this little loophole. And I'm so jealous that you got those Ocala properties. Those were, those were a good deal. Yeah. Yes. I think you've got a lot of built-in equity on those. 
Absolutely. I mean, none of us knew where we were going with it, but even at the mm -hmm. time that you guys were advertising it, you could just get 10% or more return for a long-term rental. And I thought that that was fantastic. I think sometimes people think, oh, if you're a real estate investor, buying through a turnkey provider is sort of cheating. You know, you didn't have to go out there and hustle and find the property, but honestly, a good deal is a good deal is a good deal. So I had been in real estate since 2014 I'd owned and I, I bought with you guys in 2019 and I was like, Hey, they're creating amazing deals, amazing opportunities. So why do I need to go chase something and make it harder for myself? I don't think you have to. Oh, I, I really appreciate that because there is a, yeah. uh, a belief that you do have to work hard, at least in some groups with uh, real wealth members. Sometimes it's just impossible. You know, if they, if you have a 40 hour, 50 or 60 hour work week or more uh, for many people in the Silicon Valley, how could you possibly, uh, you know, go out and do it yourself? And I mean, maybe some people do, but it's a lot harder. We've got people internationally who sometimes can't even get out to see the property, but they really want sure. to get into the market. So I, I, I love that. And then sometimes at the time of purchase, it's really maybe not a huge discount, maybe no discount, but it's kind of what you see coming that matters. I mean, at, at the time, those, those, uh, you know, one of our investment counselors bought one as well and they weren't cheap. I mean, it still took a lot of guts to buy one. What, what was the cost of the, well, for remember? the quad, it was 420 and that felt like a lot. I think it was the most expensive property I had bought up until that point. And I was like, okay, you know, this, this better work. And, yeah. you know, I think they're selling similar products now for 695, I think I saw the other day. So oh I'm that that's incredible. And the cash flow is really good. And who knows, maybe I'll turn it into a medium term rental. So I could make it even better. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that is, that is so cool. All right. Well, let's, um, kind of look into the process because it is, we haven't talked about it much and we, I haven't done the medium term, but I've heard so much about it. There's a difference in contracts, right? If you, if you're going to rent to someone over 30 days, do you need to have a, a regular real estate contract or rental contract versus a short term rental? Yeah. So it depends where you book it through. If you book it through Airbnb and it, it sort of depends where you live as well. If you're in a very landlord friendly state, I would say it's fine. But if you're in California, people sometimes get a little bit concerned, um, about just squatting rights. And so you might want to do a lease on every single stay. I generally through Airbnb or Verbo, like vacation rental by owner, I just don't do a lease. But if I do it through Furnish Finder or direct booking, I will do a lease. And it's the same lease that you would use anyway. It's just that you're doing a month to month or you're doing a shorter term. And how do you get that lease? I mean, do you, are, are you self-managing when you do it through uh, Furnish Finder? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Furnish it finder. is Furnish Finder. Um, I am self-managing and I have the help of assistance, but, um, it's pretty easy because there's not as much turnover. I sort of came from the short term rental world where there was a lot of turnover, you know, every three days. And so this seems like a real vacation to only move a tenant in every three months. Um, but you can get leases online, like something like, um, avail or apartments.com. They'll have leases for your specific state. I think actually furnish finder has them as well. Um, or something like bigger pockets. I know you're a bigger pockets host. So if people go through there, um, they also provide leases. That's awesome. An awesome service. All right. Yeah. So how did you get here? How did you get started in real estate such that now you have written a book about it? So let's first talk about that. Yes. What's, the name of, what's the title of your book? We have the book right here. It's called 30 days stay. And I wrote it with Sarah Weaver. So she's another investor. We're both big travelers. And so our investment portfolios let us travel the world and they support us through that. So I think it's just we, we tried to include a lot of travel stories to make it really fun. And you wrote our foreword and it's so fun because you wrote it in uh, Norway, right? So you were, you were the travel spirit as you were writing your foreword. So I, I loved seeing that. That was yeah. a good match. Yeah. That, that, there's a funny story with that Norway trip, by the way. I, I don't know if I told you, I don't think I've told our audience that uh, I just really wanted to spend time with our daughter, our 23-year-old, before she ends up 
getting married and having babies, which isn't in the plan, but will be right at some point. And she was, um, she's been traveling quite a bit after she graduated from college. And I just thought, you know what, I got to go see her and do these things that I might not have this chance. Uh, so she was going to Europe to Norway, uh, with her boyfriend and, I'm like, you guys, can I just third wheel? Can I just cu- come along? I want to spend time with you. They're like, yeah, come on, mom. Of course, you know, free dinners was probably what they were most excited about. But when uh, I was flying from the LA area and they were in New York, they were visiting grandma. They were going to fly from New York. I get a call as I was about to board the plane. And Krista says, mom, I can't find my passport. And like, what do you mean? She goes, I don't know. Turns out she had left it in the rental car and the rental car had already been re-rented and she had to travel all around to try to find this passport. They didn't check the the glove box. So I'm sitting there going, well, do I just go with your boyfriend? (laughs) So (laughs) so, like, Alec, is this weird? He's like, I don't know, let's go. And you know, we figured she'd find her passport in a day. It took her a week. So when I was writing the foreword, I, tr- I was in Norway with my daughter's boyfriend. We traveled for a week. We had so much fun that uh, he, I totally approve. If he ever pops the question, I approve. But that was that was my Norway story. Traveled with wow. with, with my daughter's boyfriend. We would send her pictures of these romantic dinners. They wish you were here. <laughs> oh my <laughs> I gosh, she middle. must have been so mad. She's like <laughs> scrambling all over trying to find her passport. Oh, that sounds like the worst. Yeah, and we, yeah. you know, we would take six hour boat rides and train rides and just talk and talk. It was, it was really a wonderful way to get to meet your future son-in-law for sure. <laughs> oh and could goodness. have gone very wrong as well. I could be like, not this guy, hon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, he was great. Uh, So, yeah. And then I met Sarah at, uh, I think, the Best Ever Conference. Just randomly, uh, she ended up coming to lunch with somebody else I was having lunch with. And I was so impressed with her travel and that she was able to fund that travel through these medium term rentals. And uh, so how, okay, so how did you get started So I got started in 2012, so a really long time ago with um, short-term rentals. And so I got started by renting out a room. I had just heard about Airbnb, a friend of mine who's actually been on your show, Yanni Garcia. He's a lender that was on your show a little while ago. But he told me about Airbnb um, and started doing it himself. And it wasn't until he did it for an entire year and he was very persistent that I needed to try this strategy um, that I got into it. And the reason I did is because he said he made $50,000 off an apartment that he didn't own. So he was living in New York and he was just subletting his apartment um, and traveling the world. And so I just kind of dipped a toe into it and Airbnb became like my whole life. I had no idea that it would be this whole journey that it set me off on. So I started by renting out a room, then I got more apartments, then I bought places and I was managing, um, in five countries. So I've had a lot of experience with short-term rentals, but it wasn't until COVID hit that I thought, oh my gosh, uh, this business I built over the last eight years of all of these short-term rentals might go away overnight. And I knew I had to pivot. I knew I had to try something else. And so I thought, hey, can I rent for longer stays without having people come and need to do tours? Because a lot of my places weren't in state. They were far away. Um, And so I figured it out. And it's not like it's a totally new strategy. I mean, people have been doing executive rentals forever, but it's just recently gotten really, really big, really popular. So yeah, we capitalized that on that with our book. And I think it's valuable for your listeners because I know a lot of people are using real estate to transition into their retirement. And I think if you're doing cash flow only and long-term rentals, it could just take a lot of rentals. But if you do something like medium-term rentals, well, you can have, you know, a thousand dollars per property in cash flow. Um, even today when you're thinking, gosh, there's no cash flow out there. So I just like to show people that there's another way. Always having a backup plan is important. Ironically, mm-hmm. short-term rentals ended up just being amazing during COVID because that's when we started yeah. ours. And we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Especially if, you're, if your rental was uh, pretty, I guess, isolated, isolated from breathing air, anybody else's air. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> How much more can you make? Like, let's say you have this quad and you're renting it, uh, you know, as a regular long-term rental. If you turned all four units into medium term, how much more would you potentially make? Yeah. So I was actually looking in that area just recently to kind of get an idea. And so my units, I think they're rented out for like 1100, 1150 sort of depends on if they're an interior unit or on the outside. Um, and I think that I could probably get closer to 1800, 2000. Um, so there is a lot more money per unit that can happen there. Um, and this is true also for individual condos. And why I think that's really good for people to know is that a lot of investors avoid the condo. They don't like HOAs and, and they just don't see the opportunity, but condos are actually so hands-off. And so one thing that I love, like I said, is that these one-bedroom condos are often overlooked and you can get good deals with them. But also there's a certain type of condo where you don't have your own furnace, you don't have your own water heater because it's kind of a communal boiler, something through the building. And some of those even don't have your own washer and dryer. So it's a community thing. So when you own condos like that, there is no cap X. There is nothing that can break in your condo except your you know, fridge. <laughs> so I, I like having properties like that where I can really predict what my income is going to be every month. Hmm. That's, that's awesome. All right. And what about furnishing? Um, it, uh, how long does it take to kind of make enough money to pay that off? I mean, what, what would a two bedroom cost to furnish? Yeah. So I did a two bedroom recently. We bought one in Denver where I live. Um, well I'm in Boulder, but it's close by and we spent $8,000, but it was because we weren't in state. And so I also had to use some of that to, um, hire two people to help me furnish it. So it was my assistant and another assistant that I have for showings. And uh, they loved it. They had a great time and we got it furnished in three days. So it can be really quick. You can do it a lot cheaper if you're getting used furniture. So sometimes people like to go on, um, Facebook marketplace or something like that, but what you save in money, you spend in time. So we have started just ordering everything and building it and doing it as quick as possible. So we can have that property renting and cash flowing before we've got, um, a mortgage to pay, right? Cause you've got about a month buffer there. So, um, for us, that property makes a thousand dollars a month in profit. And so it would take eight months to pay that back, but I intend to hold that property for a really long time. So I'm not too worried about that. Yeah. I talked to somebody at the, I think at the bigger pockets conference, which was amazing by the way. It was. Yeah. I would say don't miss it. You know, for anyone who hasn't gone, it was, it was really fun and lots of great learning. Uh, but I, I heard somebody saying that they have to change out their short-term rental furniture, like every few years. And I, I just thought, wow, that's got to get expensive. And is that normal? Yeah. So when I was doing short-term rentals a lot, I would go to my properties every year and a half and check out the furniture. And I think for me, it was because most of the furniture was used. So when you get used furniture, you don't really know how much life is left in it, right? You just like, you, you didn't, you weren't as intentional with the fabrics and you don't know how people are treating it. So that's a little bit hard and it might not last as long. I think the way that I'm buying furniture now, it will last a lot longer and it will be in style a lot longer. Um, so I'm not so worried about having to change it out, but yeah, you occasionally have to get new sheets and things, but it's still worth it. I think. Oh yeah. The sheets aren't too expensive. I just thought, man, if you're getting a new couch every couple of years, that's going to add up. And does it really make sense? But it's, yeah. I, I imagine there's uh, certain brands that are more com for commercial use. And in fact, I think Wayfair has that they have commercial um, short-term rental furnishings on there. I, I haven't tried that though. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Well, you'll have to report back with your short-term rental and, and let us know how it goes over the next couple of years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, ours has slowed down a lot. Um, I think, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on the amount of people who are doing short term now and with the, it, it does seem to be like people are going back to work and maybe they don't get to travel and work, work remotely as much as they could over the past two years. What are your thoughts on the future of short term rentals 
compared to? I think it's just like real estate. And because, you know, you're doing on the market and you're doing trending stuff, like, you know, better than anyone that there's just ups and downs in these markets, right? Trends change. And so I think as we're potentially moving this towards this recession, it's just that people are maybe being a little more cautious with their money. And so the travel that they're going to start doing is more essential travel. So I think that things are going to start moving more towards urban markets because instead of, you know, going on this lofty vacation by plane or going to these places they don't need to go to the, you know, more drive to destinations, they're going to go, I have to see family. So I'm going to do that. Or, you know, I have to do this trip for work and that's at a business center. Um, So I just think that it's going to change a little for now, but I think that short term rentals always will have their place. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I just wonder if it got a little bit saturated and for people who are experiencing, uh, you know, a lot less income than they thought on their short-term rentals, it could be that the medium-term rental could be a solution. Yeah. So maybe you'll be changing yours into a medium-term rental. Who knows? But I think what's great about it is that it's a lot easier. You don't have to worry about all the regulations that short-term has. Um, and yeah, it can just get you more cash flow in a market or a time where people are worried that they won't be able to cash flow. And it's also a great plan B for your short-term rentals, just in case. Well, that, you made a good great point. A good plan B. That, that's a great point about the regulations. It's not regulated the same way. No, it's essentially right. seen as a long-term rental. So you're going to be in this safe gray area for forever, I think. Yeah, that's that's a game changer for areas where it's starting to be questionable or or even banned. So, ah, very good. Well, any last thoughts for our listeners who want, you know, are considering this? Yeah, I would say, you know, don't get stuck in something like, oh gosh, the furniture has to be perfect. It's like, reach out to people like us. Sarah and I have furnishing lists, like happy to share. Um, It's so doable. You can definitely, you know, get out there and and get it done. But I think that people get stuck, you know, they get in the analysis paralysis and it's like, you just need some other people along the way cheering you on. So we're happy to be those cheerleaders. Reach out to us. Wonderful. And they can get your book where? Bigger Pockets. So biggerpockets.com slash 30 day stay. Wonderful. And finally, where are you off to next for your travels? Well, I'm in Maui right now, so (laughs) I'm already traveling, but I get back to Boulder this weekend. And then in two weeks, I'll be in Columbia. So always traveling. Oh, so exciting. And the cost of living is so low in some of these areas, right? Yeah. Compared to Boulder. And Maui. <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> yeah. that cheap right now. Yeah, no, yeah. it never has been. Uh, so. But yeah, I mean, I would like, I would, that was what was so cool about talking with Sarah too, when I met her is you don't have to really create a lot of income when your expenses aren't too high. And absolutely. Uh, I love the example that you're both setting of, you know, just go out and live your dreams. Now you don't have to wait until you're 65. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they're different dreams then, right? So you got to live these dreams now and then you'll have those for later. That's perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom here on the real wealth show. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you want to find out more about how to acquire rental property that you can use for short-term, medium-term, or long-term rental, uh, just go to realwealthshow.com. And when you're there, you can schedule an appointment with one of our investment counselors who will help you find what you're looking for. I'm Kathy Fetke, and thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.